Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lorna, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And I'm thrilled at last to be up here. Um, uh, anyway, um, I want to thank you so much. Uh, it's, I, I've had such a warm, warm welcome. And um, I love, you know, I'm not familiar with this room, but I already love this room. And the testimonies last night uh, were very powerful. And one can feel when one comes in here, uh, hmm, the suffering and the joy and the recovery that's in these four walls. And uh, it's very powerful, and I'm very uh, grateful that you've asked me to come here and be your speaker this evening. And before I forget my manners, I I want to uh, also thank the committee for choosing me and for Melissa for arranging this and uh, for Melissa uh, for giving Emily the task of being my hostess this today. Um, we've had a great time. We have a huge age difference between us and yet she was a dear friend for me and um, it's terrific. We were discovering, you know, that when she was uh, born, I was already mm, sober, but um, uh, I uh, the um, it's like stunning, you know. I, I was telling her that I remember being in a, in a meeting once, and this woman was whining on and on about being 35 years old and wasn't married, and her life was a mess. And some fellow said, "Oh, for God's sake, shut up!" He said, "I've got suits that are older than you." And um, so uh, it's uh, it was wonderful, and we did have a grand day. You know, we went around, we we shopped, and we went to the. Uh, Art Center, and quite frankly, you know, I was a little surprised that Des Moines, Iowa, has such a fabulous collection in its Art Center. I mean, I was really blown away. So um, I'm very uh, grateful because I know that you have uh, the opportunity of all sorts of people that you can choose to come here. And not only have you brought me here from the holy city of New York, but you have, um, but uh, I was, I'm staying in a very SMART hotel, and a lovely gift basket, and uh, just very, very nice, very, very nice, I, I feel quite special. Anyway, um, when I first used to speak, I used to think, uh, when I finished speaking, I used to think afterwards, good God, the next time I speak, I must get my story straight, you know, and I realized there's no getting it straight, because it changes all the time. Um, For instance, um, uh, the thing of recovery, you know, before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and in fact, you know, before you made me an alcoholic, I had um, a very decent childhood. I had a very nice childhood. And then as I sort of grew in recovery, I thought, oh, my God, my childhood was terrible, deprived, terrible. And my parents took on sort of a demonic proportions eventually, you know. And uh, then as I got more sober, I realized they were the perfect parents. And I was very grateful to have those parents and things turned around. And, you know, when I first came in, um, I felt that, uh, you know, lower than low, and then I got into this thing of I deserve and I should have, and um, and like, actually my sponsor used to say to me, there were two things she never wanted to hear out of my mouth. One of them was, it's hard for me. You know, <laughs> it's hard for me to make phone calls. It's hard for me to be friendly. It's hard for me to, you know, end the sentence. And she said the other thing was, she didn't want to hear was, I deserve. I deserve to be happy. I deserve a nice relationship. I deserve a good job. She said, honey, if you got what you deserve, (laughs) you should be grateful that you have a God of mercy and not a God of justice. So 
everything has uh, flipped for me uh, in sobriety. And if you stay sober long enough, eventually it uh, keeps coming around and around and one's solid ideas change. And uh, the other thing I used to feel was that I I would think and say, you know, I hope there's something I can say that's helpful to you. And I now realize that I'm not here to help you at all. And it's very arrogant to think that I might uh, be able to help you. I'm here because God thinks that I need an awful lot of help. And um, I get the opportunity to speak, to have myself reflected. So I'm very grateful. The thing I think that really um, is the keynote for my drinking and sums it up Hmm. is that I, life passed by and I just could never get it together to get things done. I mean, I came of age in the 60s and I've never been to a rock concert. And, you know, I was friendly with Mick Jagger and I just, it just all seemed too much to get to a rock concert. I've, um, I'm interested in the ballet and I've never seen Nureyev or Fontaine dance. It just seemed like too much to get a ticket to go. I'm intrigued even today about people that ski, that they actually get all that equipment together and the skis and then they get to the travel, to the slopes, and then they get on those lifts, and the, oh, it's just like, oh, it's too much. And um, <laughs> so, so much of life just passed me by. I just couldn't, and I think actually one of the saddest sentences in the Bible is, and Jesus passed by. Can you imagine sort of someone saying, hey, you should have been here a minute ago. Do you know just to walk by here? I mean, um, But that was the story of my life. I just kind of missed out. And at the the my the my bottom isn't some thunderous um, bell clanging uh, bottom. It was a slow rotting disintegration of the fabric of my life. And I often describe it as a plane coming into land without its landing gear. You know, I belly flopped along the runway for quite a while, and finally all the undercarriage was scraped, and the wings were hanging off, and the passengers were strewn all over the place, and there were panties and bras on the bushes, and (laughs) luggage, and, you know, I mean, it was just a mess. And um, part of the belly flopping was I was in London, I had a very prestigious job. I'm the first woman art auctioneer in America with a very uh, highfalutin auction house. And uh, I was in London um, on business. And part of the business was we had this very big dinner dance at a very smart hotel in London and all the clients were there and the senior members of the company and um, I was all done up like a dog's dinner in a ball gown and that, you know, I was looking very grand. And... While they were dancing, I was going from table to table, emptying their glass into mine. (laughs) And I knew there was something the matter with what I was doing. I knew that somehow my behavior didn't go with my outfit. But um, I couldn't quite get what it was that was the matter. And... um, I forgave myself by saying, oh, you know, they wouldn't understand, and who gives a damn about them, and they're square, and I don't care. Anyway, um, I was, of course, uh, having a tawdry affair, as one often does when women are coming into the program, and it was sort of like some gut-wrenching, awful heartbreak thing with some creep. And um, (laughs) I... um, I... uh, you know, I, I, was, I wanted to come back to New York to, it was uh, July of 1976, and America was celebrating its bicentennial, and I wanted to see the tall ships going up the Hudson and the East River. And um, I was so enveloped in the, uh, this affair and what had gone wrong. He was in Paris, I was in London. I mean, it sounds very glamorous, but really, you know it wasn't. And um, just... Icky, icky. And 
I remember being so wrapped up in self that my father was standing by the garden gate waving me goodbye as I went to London Airport. And I was like, yeah, bye. I just... And it was the last time I was to see my father. He died very suddenly. And that memory fills me with regret. You know, they say you will not regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. I regret that. I regret it very much that I didn't take the time with my father to just spend time with him and to pay attention and to be with this man. And uh, the opportunity passed me by. And um, I came back to New York expressly to see those tall ships. And um, I live on Manhattan Island. I live on a piece of land that is surrounded with water. And I didn't know how to get to the river. I didn't know that I could have gone out of my apartment and turned left or right, and I would have hit a river eventually, you know? But it was like skiing. It was all too much for me. And... Um, so I stayed by myself. The whole of America was celebrating. And I missed the whole thing. And I was in my apartment by myself drinking. And um, it passed me by. And, uh, you know, I um, was going... Uh, this chap came back from Paris and uh, I... Uh, at the end of my drinking, I had brunch with him this particular day, and I got up in the morning, and I'd fix myself a carafe of vodka and orange juice, and um, I poured myself a tumblerful, sort of like this, you know, breakfast drink, of course, and um, I, I drank down this, I love drinking on an empty stomach, and I drank down this, a great gulp of this vodka and orange juice concoction, and I remember thinking to myself, I took it and I looked at it and I said, good God, I am drinking in the morning. This is a morning drink. And I looked at it with great wonderment. And it is said, you know, that the beginning of wisdom is to call something by its correct name. Now, I've had a drink in the morning many, many times. But I called it brunch. Or I called it a, I called it a gallery opening. Or I called it toasting the bride. Or summertime. Or on the beach. Or something. I, I lived in Spain for a short while. I had cognac in my coffee every morning. And I called it continental. I mean, <laughs> I never called it drinking in the morning. Well, this morning, you know, God was chasing me, and I saw, and the, the clarity of, oh, goodness, this is a morning drink. And, um, but then the disease came whispering, and the disease said, mm, Lorna, really, the sort of woman you are, the kind of job you have to hold down, the mind of you, just the you of being you, why why do you make life so difficult for yourself? Why don't you give yourself a little break? Why don't you do this every morning? It would be so helpful to go to work with a little lining of vodka and orange juice in your stomach. It would help. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. And um, I, I was having brunch with this chap, and... Um, I got in the shower, and with that thought, I could not release the glass from my hand. I could not physically put the glass down. And I was, you know, washing myself, trying to keep the glass out of the spray of the shower. And um, I had brunch with this fellow, and um, it was a disaster, horrible. We parted angry. And I ended up on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to New York and seen the museum, but it's got, you know, a big flight of steps going up. And, and it was summertime, August, and um, they were, um, people were sitting on the steps, you know, people were together and, and um, uh, going up and down the stairs and tourists and life. It was life in New York on a summer afternoon. It's just happening. 
and I could see it. I could see that it was life, and I couldn't get to it. And up until that time, I'd never felt so screamingly alone in all my life. Now, I had a big job. I was very young. I was, it, just before I, I came into the program, you're going to be stunned to hear, just before my 31st birthday. And um, why did I have no one to be with when I was 30 years old? Why had I no friends? Why was I so alone? Why was I so isolated? And you know, I'm 28 years sober, and it's just that part of my disease is just occurring to me how isolated I was. And um, anyway, I felt lonelier. I felt as lonely or lonelier in sobriety. But up until that time, I'd always squash that feeling with booze or drugs or something. And, um, you know, acid was one of my favorite things. But um, I... Uh, I um, I remember I stood up and I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do. And a voice whispered, go to one of those AA meetings. And I went to a meeting and I walked in and I heard a woman speak. And this woman was oh, very old. She looked to me, she's probably the same age I am now. And she... Uh, had broken capillaries all on her va face, and she looked used. But she was sober. And she told my story up to where I was at that very moment. And then she went on for another 15 years. And I got to see coming attractions. I knew instantly, oh my God, I'm looking at myself. 15 years down the road. And all of a sudden, I knew it was alcohol. I knew I drank. I, and I said to myself over and over again with this stunning thing, like people when they get bad news, it's like, no, 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 no. I was like, my God, I drink. It's drinking. I drink. It's not the husband or the lover or the country or the job or my friends or my parents. It's I'm drinking. I couldn't. It was like I drink. It's not. I, 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 you know, I, I drank all the time, but I couldn't see that I drank. And um, to backtrack on this, I was familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't just show up there. I, I was married and this husband walked out the door. And I thought it was the most fascinating thing he'd ever done, actually. And um, <laughs> it, it really caught my attention. And um, I was dreadfully upset about this breakup of this marriage. And I was with a friend one night in a sauna. We were sitting there naked. And uh, she said to me that the previous night she had gone to this meeting called Al-Anon. And um, she said, you know, Lorna, all the women sound just like you. So she told me a little bit about it, and I thought it sounded fascinating. It was a good way to get my husband back, because it, it, I thought, well, you know, he's like that. He drinks. And um, I went to this meeting called al -Anon, and the following, and at that meeting, they suggested that one go to open AA meetings. So the following night, I was to do something. This is now about June of 76. This is the belly flop starting. I was to do something that I was to repeat quite a few times. After work, I worked, my office, uh, I was at Sotheby's, and then we were on Madison Avenue and 76th Street, and right opposite us was the Carlisle Hotel. And we all liked to go over there after work and drink, those of us that did that. And um, so I went to the bar with them after work, and uh, I loved, as I said, to drink on an empty stomach. I didn't eat all day, and that first vodka and orange juice, whoom! And um, so it got to be almost 7.30, and I said to my friends, ooh, it's almost 7.30. I'm going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll be back. And um, I toddled up the road to this meeting called Lennox Hill, 
And Lenox Hill in New York in those days was considered the very sort of silk stocking, blue blood meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. There were, you know, the lawyers and the doctors and the ladies that lived on Park Avenue and all that type were there. And um, I walked in and I, it was an, I'd researched it. I knew that it was an open AA meeting and that people like myself who weren't alcoholics could go there. So um, I went. And uh, it was a three-speaker meeting. And this chap got up on the stage, and he said, Good evening, my name's Don, and I'm an alcoholic. And I can remember thinking to myself, Well, good God, we don't all want to know. I mean, <laughs> surely there's some things you keep to yourself. You know, um, aren't you ashamed to say that out loud? But, even though I was kind of like horrified that he would just like say it like that, I was intrigued with this guy, absolutely fascinated with his story. And then after him, two others got up there and told equally as interesting stories. And to be quite frank, I think that is what qualifies me as an alcoholic. I think if you like coming to these meetings, you know, hearing about how people... Hmm, attempted suicide or murder or, uh, you know, lost their jobs or their families or threw up on their clients or were crawling on the bathroom floor, waking up in strange places, and you find that fascinating. There's something the matter with you. Um, there's, and, you know, not only was I in, am I intrigued, I'm still intrigued after 28 years, and I like to go to coffee shops and talk about it, I like to get on the phone and talk about it even more. I mean, you know, it's not quite right. Um, you know, in these rooms we talk about, you know, someone will say, well, I attempted suicide, and we all sort of chuckle and nudge each other and go, well, I tried that too. And, you know, someone, someone outside would be absolutely horrified at uh, that. Anyway, um, so I was, uh, I had, was coming to AA to get this husband back. But I was, you know, going out with this other fellow. Um, and it was a little muddle. Um, and I wanted to marry this other chap, the fellow that was in Paris. Uh, the, the fact that he hadn't asked me or even mentioned it seemed to be not a problem, minor. Um, <laughs> And the reason I wanted to marry him was that he had, the, he had the one thing in the world I wanted. And it wasn't a great love of me or a noble character or fine manners or anything like that that are important to me. He had a maid. And I was... <laughs> And I was desperate for the maid, you know. I wanted to someone to run my bath, to lay my clothes out, to brush my hair, to tell me to get up, to lay the food on. I was too busy once. I was much too busy. And um, I tell you, I was willing to let this fellow touch the sacred temple in order to get to the maid. And, um, you know, In some circles, that's called prostitution. <laughs> uh, however, one, you know, part of my seedy bottom, part of my just tawdry, I think it's a very female sort of situation, was um, one weekend I'd stayed over at his place on a Saturday night and We'd been intimate with each other, but, you know, what did I know about intimacy? What did I know about the sacredness of my body and, and uh, feelings of love between two human beings? It was, it was coffee, bagel, and intercourse, as far as I was concerned. You know, it was sort of nothing, nothing to treasure or anything like that. And um, I woke up this Sunday morning, and we're in his den, and, you know, you can imagine the whole sleazy scene. I'm wearing his dressing gown, and... Um, I'm reading the New York Times, and he is on the phone with another woman making a date for that afternoon. And, you know, I can say that he was a creep, 
But that's the level I was at. And that's what I was attracting into my life. And I had this very grand job and this very mm, class kind of exterior. And underneath was this tawdry, mucky, icky sort of life, unexamined. And um, anyway, I uh, went to that first AA meeting on that Sunday in August of 1976. And um, I, ten days later, I was on a business trip in Washington, and I was with some friends, and after we'd done the business, we were at this uh, client's house, and we had dinner. And uh, dinner was served, and there was a goblet, of, a goblet at each plate, and wine was poured. And I didn't know enough, and listen, newcomers, listen to this part of my story. I didn't know enough to say no thank you. I didn't know enough to remove that glass. I didn't know enough to ask them to take it away. I thought the whole process of sobriety was about learning to resist alcohol. I thought that I was in here to learn how to be cool around alcohol, to to act like, no, 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 it doesn't bother me if you drink. Go right ahead. I'm fine. Mm, it's not that way at all. I'm in here to learn that when I'm around that stuff, bells should go off. That that's, it's a danger. I'm not in here to be cool around it. And um, I've had a deadly dance with alcohol. You know, we had an incestuous, involved, passionate mm, dance and it won, and um, I've surrendered. But then I didn't know, and so I resisted it through the salad. I resisted it through the main course. I resisted it through dessert. And then they were serving, you know, cheese and crackers and drinking coffee, and this goblet is still sitting there. And finally, this goblet starts talking to me, and it said to me, Oh, Lorna, you're always so bloody dramatic. What are you doing in Alcoholics Anonymous for your simple problem? I'm not your problem. I'm on your side. Don't you always feel better when we're together? Look, look at the other people at this table. Are they crying and telling inappropriate details of their personal lives to the other guests? No, they're not. Are they uh, laughing too loudly? Are they telling crude jokes? No. Why can't you be like them? Why can't you sip? Why do you always have to knock it back? You know, I'm with you. I'm not against you. Your problem is you need to lose 10 pounds. And you need to go to the gym. Have you ever read the classics? No, you've never read the classics. Why don't you take a course? And it went on and on like this. And finally I said, you know, you're absolutely right. I have really overreacted. And I reached out and I took this goblet of wine, which by now was sacred elixir, and um, <laughs> I took a sip of this wine. And whereas ten days before, on that Sunday where I sat on the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I had drunk all day, all night. I could not get drunk. I couldn't get sober. I took this one sip and my soul went into total terror. I felt that terror in sobriety. But the, it was so powerful for me. And I felt as though these huge doors were coming across the film of my life. And they were going to shut with this huge thud. And I was going to be on one side and you were going to be on the other. And I would be irretrievable. It wouldn't be like you didn't want me with you. It would be like you weren't able to get to me. You know, there's a fabulous story in the Bible. I think it's very poignant. 
I know you can mention Jesus in an AA meeting and clear the room, and I don't mean to be offensive to anyone, but um, there's a fabulous story, you know, where Jesus, uh, there's a young man comes to him and he says, you know, what do I have to do to gain the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, well, you have to do, you know, honor your father and mother and give to the poor and all that. He says, well, I've done all that. And Jesus says to him, well, that's terrific. Now you have to uh, sell all that you have and come and follow me. And... um, in other words, Jesus was saying, you know, you have to let go of all your old ideas and take on some, come and see what we're up to. And um, the young man, it said he had many possessions, he had many ideas, and he turned away. Couldn't do it. Turned away. And it says that Jesus looked after him sorrowing. It doesn't say Jesus ran after him and said, oh, look, 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 all right, all right, all right. For you, the kingdom of heaven is half price. You know, we'll make a deal today. <laughs> And um, it was like that, uh, I can't remember, why. where was I up to? Why was I telling you that story? Oh, the doors were closing, yes. Mm-hmm. I, I forget, anyway. So let's go on another track. Um, um, but I could, I knew that, uh, why was I telling you that? Oh, the... Oh, you couldn't, yes, it's all right, don't worry. But, um, are you trying to adjust something? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I want to get this part. Yes, yeah, so don't, 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 hang on a It's. I'm going to think of the answer. To, here it's coming, here it's coming, no. Um, but... Uh, This is the sort of thing that keeps you very humble. <laughs> anyway, I the following day, I uh, I was I, I was so terrified with that example. And the following day, I came back to New York on the train, and all the way back, I cried and I begged God, please let me back in, please let me with those people. Oh, I know why I was telling you the story was because no matter how much you wanted me to be with you, you couldn't come, you weren't going to reach, you weren't, couldn't get me out of that, I had to want it and come to you, and um, so I, I begged God to let me back in, and I threw my bags in my office, and I went back to that meeting of Lenox Hill, and um, I sat down in the front row, and I said, I'm here for myself, and uh, some chap came up to me, and he said, you can't sit there. He said, George and Gertrude, whatever their names were, he said, have been coming here for 20 years and they always sit in those seats and you can't sit there. And somewhere from the depths of this low self-esteem, I got the courage. I knew that if I left, I wasn't coming back. Somehow I knew those doors were never going to open for me again. And it was going to pass me by like those tall ships I was going to miss out. I was going to miss out on the Father, all that stuff. And I said, I don't care who sits here. I'm here now, and I'm not leaving. And um, I haven't left. Thank God I haven't left. But it's not that I haven't left. It's that, you have you know, our third tradition says the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. I didn't have that desire to stop drinking. You had the desire for me to not drink. Your desire for me not to drink was far stronger than my desire to uh, stay sober. I didn't even know what sobriety was. And, you know, so I'm across the threshold. I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm in. But being in doesn't mean to say that the whole thing is revealed to me. It's a process. And, you know, I thought to myself, well, I thought actually that you looked at me and you thought, and spoke among yourselves and said, well, thank God Lorna has arrived, because now we can hold our heads up high. Because we don't have to be quite so anonymous, because she gives us great class and cachet. And um, she will sort of lead us out of the quagmire of anonymity into the brilliant sunshine of publicity or something like that. I don't know what I thought. But anyway, I thought that that's what you were thinking on one hand. 
and in reality, and then also I thought, oh my God, I hope they find out that I'm not a real alcoholic. I hope they don't find out that I don't really, I don't really drink, that I have no idea how to make a martini, that I don't know the alcoholic contents of something, that um, I hope they don't find out that I'm not a real alcoholic and kick me out. And, you know, while I had those grandiose ideas, I also felt that someone was going to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, listen, sister, you know, exactly how much have you drunk? I mean, we're a busy organization in here, and please, you know, leave until you've got a story. And we notice you always sit in the front row, and you eat an awful lot of cookies, and do you mind? And um, I thought they were going to kick me out. And, you know, I was, that's why I say there's no getting my story straight. It was such a muddle when I came in, and I thought, uh, then I thought, you know, I'd nipped it in the bud. I thought that I had got, to, I wasn't a, I, I had tendencies. Oh, yes, I could see that I had tendencies towards alcoholism, but I didn't really have it because... And one of the signposts I knew why I didn't really have a bad case of it was because I heard that some people were here five years and ten years and fifteen and the really sick ones were here a lot longer. And I thought to myself, poor dears, oh, God you know, they must really have drunk and damaged a lot of brain cells because they can't remember from one day to the next and they have to keep coming back because they can't remember. Oh, yeah, I drink. Oh, yeah, I mustn't drink today. Oh, I thought, well, the preamble might be a little tricky and, you know, I'll get those steps down, but I won't be here. I'm not going to be here years, for God's sakes. You know, how long does it take to get this stuff? Well, I'm 28 years and I'm still trying to get it. And um, so... You know, meanwhile, while all these thoughts are raging in my mind, you're patting me on the back and you're saying, you keep coming back. You're in the right place. And I didn't know how you knew I was new. I don't know how you could tell that I was a newcomer. Um, The fact that I'd been wearing the same dress for three months um, might have been a dead giveaway. And I was festooned with jewellery. I had jewelry. Now, don't forget, this is long before multiple piercings came out and long before, you know, any of that. I had jewelry all over the place. And um, I had and I had gobs of makeup on, gobs of it. And I couldn't be bothered to take it off every night, you know. <laughs> it was too much. So... I was sort of like Elizabeth I. I just slathered more on every day. And I wondered how you knew I was new, you know. And I often say, and I don't want anyone in the room to take any offense about this, but I often say I'm so glad I came in before the uh, fashion of, of piercing and tattooing came about because I'm sure I would have had the Last Supper put on my chest or something. You know? <laughs> and, I probably would have had a plate put in my lower lip or something. But um, you knew I was new, and you were very, very patient with me. And uh, I wasn't terribly friendly. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I was a little standoffish, and I have this Britishness about me and all that. But I, I got a sponsor, and, and my sponsor, and I couldn't get a hold of my drinking story. And my sponsor was fabulous for me because she didn't ram that down my throat. She just thought it was, you know, miraculous that I was coming and really realized, really allowed the spirit to knew that my story would be revealed to me in time as I needed it and as I could contain it, it would be revealed to me. And, um, but she said this thing to me, which I always try and share when I speak because it was so powerful. She said to me, Lorna, if you stay with us, you will be able to develop a life that will be like having a quiver of golden arrows on your back. And when you come into a situation in life that you're not too sure how to handle, you'll be able to reach back, select the perfect arrow, put it in your bow, and hit bullseye every time. And that idea was so intoxicating to me to be appropriate in the world. You know, no one ever said to me, 
you drink too much. People said to me things like, shh, <laughs> or do you mind, or I was always laughing too loudly, always inappropriate, always dressed inappropriately. You know, I was the sort that was wearing plunging necklines at funerals and things. You know, I mean, there's a uniform to one's work, what one does, if one's a film producer, one dresses one way, if one works in a bank. But I was like, I don't give a damn what they think. And uh, I'm, this is the, uh, that's probably the biggest loser phrase I can ever say. This, this. Well, that's just the way I am. And another big loser phrase is, well, that's the way I always do things. You know, when I have those two phrases going out of my mouth, I've made my world about this big and uh, tight and rigid. And um, anyway, this idea of the golden arrows was so fabulous, and I knew that you had this, Ability to be appropriate. I mean, I didn't know how to have coffee with someone without giving them the keys to my apartment. You know, I didn't know. I just didn't know where boundaries... Oh, I didn't know anything. I really didn't. Even though I was, you know, phenomenal at my work and I could sell millions of dollars worth of art, on living, I had no idea. And... um Anyway, my time is going. I have about 20 minutes, I think, left. But So I want to get into recovery. Um, it's uh, been very fascinating, <laughs> to say the least. And um, uh, my, I want to skip right to 15 years. When I was 15 years sober, I went through the worst hell I've ever, ever known. And I went through a very dark, dark night. And I think anyone getting through their teens in sobriety, it's a miracle. And, you know, the big book flew out the window. The, my sponsees became my sponsors. My pain long outlasted the patience of my friends. I felt very isolated within the program. And nothing that had worked for me before worked. People would give me platitudes like, have you done a fourth step? Oh, um, have you know? Have you? What have you done? Uh, all this stuff, and it was then that I had to really let go of spiritual arrogance. I knew how to stay sober, you know, says so in the big book. Da, 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 da. But I realised then that I was relying on myself and my way of staying sober. That I had somehow, although it didn't look it, although I was on a very deep spiritual path, I. God wasn't running the show. And I had to sink to another level of surrender, a very deep surrender. But anyway, during this time, I, I was very friendly with Mother Teresa. I had been in India many times and worked with her sisters in Calcutta. And I knew I, I couldn't work with another alcoholic. I just, I, I, I just couldn't. I'm a practicing Catholic. I... Uh, I would go to church uh, for Mass, and I, I couldn't sit there. I couldn't. I couldn't meditate. I couldn't pray. Any tool that I had had was taken from me. Anything that I relied on, well, I know how to do this, went. And, um, you know, I, I often say I was very glad at that time that I had taken notice. And anyone in the room that's new, listen up. There's some people that will say, take what you like and leave the rest. Don't do that. Take it all. Don't decide, well, I don't need this and I do need that. And, I, you know, I never drank at home, so it's all right for me to keep alcohol in the house. If, you know, I say this very passionately. If you have alcohol in the house, it's got your name on it no matter for what reason you say it's there. And alcoholics will often say, well, just because I've stopped drinking doesn't mean to say others have stopped drinking, and I don't want to impose that on my friends. And when my friends come by, I want to be able to offer them a drink. Well, you know, people that don't smoke don't keep cartons of cigarettes in the house. And um, 
Muslims don't have a side of pork in the freezer. And, uh, and I've yet to go to someone's house and they have little piles of cocaine and heroin on the, on the coffee table with syringes and, you know, and the works. And they say, well, we don't shoot up, but maybe you'd like to. You know? uh, so, when I was, when I was going through this, this trial in my life, which lasted easily four years, I was very glad that I'd taken notice of all that you told me to do, that I had no alcohol in the house. Because I say, you know, I, I don't want to drink again. Of course I don't want to drink again. Why the hell would I want to drink again? I'd be an idiot to want to drink again. But I have alcoholism, and alcoholism wants to drink again. And um, so I was very glad. And the one thing God left me with was smart feet. And my feet took me to meetings, and I screamed and I cried and I carried on. And I literally sometimes was kneeling on the floor. I was in so much pain. I, all grandiosity, everything was gone. I just flailed. Anyway, I went off to Calcutta. I thought, well, you know, I'll work. In Calcutta, you really get to see people that are worse off than you. There's no, you know, hindrance there. So I was there, and... Even, I was envying the lepers. I mean, they seemed to be better off than me. I just couldn't get to it. And uh, Mother was very, very kind to me, and she knew I was in agony. It's a spiritual uh, calamity. And um, I left Calcutta, and uh, Mother came to New York a few months later, and we met. And she asked me, how is it going for you? How is it for you? And I said, Mother, it's hell. It's absolute hell. And she looked at me and she said, oh, she said, how God must love you. She said, and he wants to be an, in, an intimate lover with you, but he is a jealous lover and he is burning out of your soul everything unlike himself. And I said, well, gee, that's just swell, mother, but, um, <laughs> you know. I wish he'd stop loving me quite so intensely here. But, you know, I want to say this for anyone that's, like, going through the teens or tough times or that. I mean, it doesn't have to be in the teens. It can usually, the onslaught can come anywhere after, like, eight years. And it seems, that this is just a generalization, it just seems from the body of experience that people have told me that they've gone through. And um, there's this thing of thinking that I've done it all wrong. My program's wrong. I've never really done a proper fourth step. I've never really done the steps correctly. Uh, there's great suffering, and I haven't gotten it right. And, um, you know, one of the most powerful stories for me, it just so touches me so powerfully, is, you know, there was a certain man in a, in a hotel in, Mayf in the Mayflower Hotel, in Akron, Ohio. His name was Bill Wilson. And he was sober, not drinking, for six months. And he was in Akron, Ohio, on business. And he was by himself. And uh, the business went south. And he was in that hotel that evening, feeling probably hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And he could hear the cocktail lounge down at one end of the hall and probably merriment and people having a grand time and the clinking of glasses and and Bill Wilson was in agony Bill Wilson was in pain Bill Wilson felt a failure and he turned and he went towards the hotel uh, directory, the lobby of the church directory and he started making phone calls and, you know, you and I are here because of that man's suffering. We are not born out of his success. We are born out of his worldly failure. We are here today because the business didn't go well. What would have happened if that business had been successful? He might have thought, aren't I great? You see? I'm terrific. Six months of sobriety, I can have a drink. I'll go and celebrate. That wife won't be here. And, blah, 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 and I'll... So 
you know, I just want to give that word of encouragement for you if you are suffering within the the term of sobriety. It's a gift. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it is a gift to us. It means that we're ready to shed the old and to break into the new. And all birth is very mucky. It's never very, it's never usually very pleasant to ascend to another level. And um, anyway, I, 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 I'm through that, thank God. But I can always, you know, I, I don't forget it. I don't forget it. It's like an acid trip. One can always have recall to it. And um, so, um, you know, my sobriety has been very, very um, um, uh, fantastic. I, I, I'd really like to get out of these terms of my disease and my sobriety. One of the things I, I fall into is talking about my disease. And I think it's very dangerous to talk about my disease. I don't have my disease. If I keep talking about my disease, I'll say, oh, well, you know, my disease talks to me and my disease says this and my disease acts like this. And it becomes this sort of little cozy thing of me and my disease. And I don't have, and eventually if I keep talking like that, then I'll start talking about my program. And if it's left up to me, I'll have a designer program, you know. I'll have nothing but dessert. I'll never have vegetables. And I cannot talk about my program or my disease. I have the disease of alcoholism, and I have to apply the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And anything any alcoholic has ever done under the influence of alcohol, I'm capable of doing if I pick up a drink. I can't say, oh, I would never do that. If an alcoholic has done it, and I drink, I could do it. So, uh, I can't, uh, anything you've ever done to stay sober, I must do to stay sober. And it's not always very jolly. You know, there's that wonderful phrase, ships are safe in the harbor, but ships aren't built for the harbor. And sometimes we're invited to take our vessel out onto the high seas, and we can't always be very safe in here. And I, I want to, you know, end the, uh, the evening. I, I could talk for hours. There's so much going on. But um, we're talking about um, beyond our wildest dreams. The, um, you know, when I came in here, you told me that life would be beyond my wildest dreams. And up until about 25 years of sobriety, I thought, well... This isn't so wild. I could think of something far wilder than this. It's not exactly <laughs> what I would call wild dreams here. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I wrote a book. It's all about me. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> but anyway, because of my book, when... Um, Mother Teresa died. Her sisters asked me if I would submit um, copies of my correspondence with her and uh, to the tribunal looking into her canonization, the cause for her canonization. And I did that. And um, I, I um, this woman, my book had gotten into the hands of this hermit this female hermit who lived in a monastery called uh, Christ in the Desert Monastery in Abiquiu, New Mexico. And she wrote to me, and she invited me to go and visit her at this monastery. And I mean, let's face it, how often does one get an invitation from a hermit? Well, so I was there. I, <laughs> I went, and I visited her, and I spent some time with her, and it was just a delightful, amazing time in this canyon with this monastery nestled right in there. It was fantastic. And um, anyway, uh, I wrote to her and I said, I've been asked for copies of my correspondence with Mother. And she wrote back and she said, I am praying that you get called as a witness for Mother. And I thought, poor old dear, you know, she's been out in the desert too long. The sun's really gotten to her. You know, Mother and I were close, but canonization, I mean, that's a little... 
So, but one day I came home from work and uh, came home, and in my mailbox was an envelope from the Metropolitan Tribunal, and it was written in very churchy language, 14th century, that sort of said, you know, we uh, ask you to come and uh, give testimony to the sanctity of this servant of God, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. So, you're looking at a witness to a saint. And um, I was called before the tribunal and uh, asked for my testimony for my friend. And um, uh, by the way, you know, I had a lot of correspondence with mother, and mother would often write to me about AA. And well, I'll tell you that in a minute. No, I'll tell you that right now. But um, uh, mother was fascinated with Alcoholics Anonymous. Mother Teresa had success with every form of human suffering, but she could not help the alcoholic. And she could not help the alcoholic because she didn't have the words of eternal life that you and I have. She didn't know how to say, I know how you feel. Let me tell you what happened to me. And in the chapel in Calcutta, there's a big, huge statue of the Blessed Virgin, and it stands on a pedestal, and under that statue, Mother put things that were important to her. You know, maybe prizes, the Nobel Prize, or things like that. And pride, <laughs> little things like that. And pride of place on that statue, pride of place, was our little um, plastic card with our 12 steps and our 12 traditions and the serenity prayer on it um, in that place in Calcutta. And... Um, Mother was intrigued with AA, and Mother wrote me often mentioning AA, and I have given one of her letters to the archives in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, I will distribute those letters that mention AA to various archives uh, throughout America, because I think it's just fabulous that, that we have that. And not necessarily at general services in New York, for the outer areas that Mother you know, would love it to have been. So, um, uh, and you think it's funny going to meetings with a newcomer. Try going to a meeting with Mother Teresa. Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, I, um, I was called as, this, as, the, as the witness for her, and you know, um, it pleased me no end. And it's beyond my wildest dreams. You know, um, and I, I got to reflect on it, like, how is that? You know, it's not about me. I thought wild dreams when I came in were going to be about money, men, and mansions. You know, I thought that's what it was. But no, it's what it is. It says beyond your wild dreams, beyond your tacky wild dreams, Lorna. <laughs> into another dimension. And the wild dreams, our dreams and the fulfillment of them are always about the other. They're not for myself alone. We do not do this for ourselves alone. We do not get married or have a great job or raise our children or have our accomplishments in sobriety for ourselves alone. If we do it for ourselves, it's this tinkling, empty kind of thing. But we do it for the whole, and we bring it here, and we share it, and we all celebrate in each other's, because it belongs to us all. And when this happened for me, you know, I am just a tiny cog in a big wheel. I mean, it's not about my canonization, although, um, <laughs> the, yet, um, but it makes me so happy to have been able to be a part of that. And, um, you know, if you had told me when I came, walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, sweetheart, if you stay sober, you can help this little old lady in Calcutta become a saint one day, I would have said, oh, please. Where's my Porsche? I mean, you know, don't, aren't I going to get something else? Is that it? And yes, that's it. And that is the highest I could possibly have, that I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Some people with all the brains in the world and all the money in the world, 
don't get to be in here. And um, I don't know why me, you know, I don't know, but um, here I am. And I'm, I'm very, um, I'm singled out. I'm very privileged. And um, it's not for me to question why. It's, uh, I've been given the gift. And I want to thank you all so much for going to meetings. I want to thank you for doing service. I want to thank you for being my friends. I want to thank you for all the service that you've done here. I want to thank you for reading the literature, for sponsoring, for allowing yourselves to be sponsored, for getting the alcohol out of your house, for doing all the things that you've done to make this 18th day of September 2004 for us all to be gathered here and um, thank you so much for your sobriety. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.